what we've seen was a, was definitely a large bird, and we think it was a mower, certainly it was a mower. Well, I take it very seriously indeed. If a raven at the tower dies, Her Majesty has got to be told straight away. There's a monster of the deep sitting there with its big beak head and didn't know what it was. animals really be harbingers of doom and what alien animals lurk in dark drains deep beneath our cities animal x investigates the weird world of animal mysteries first to new zealand where some believe a bird that science claims has been extinct for more than 500 years is back Before man walked on these isolated shores, New Zealand was home to one of nature's most primeval environments, a land time and humanity forgot, a hidden paradise home to hundreds of species. But perhaps the most extraordinary one of all was the magnificent moa bird, majestically reaching up to nearly three meters. The moa grazed these fields for over 80 million years. Then, suddenly, in the 1500s, it disappeared. Another species gone forever. Or has it? What we've seen was, a, was definitely a large bird, and we think it was a moa, certain it was a moa. Fortunately, it'd be wonderful to have these giant birds roaming around here still, but it doesn't look good, I'm afraid. There have been no moas in New Zealand for 500 plus years even in the most remote areas. Animal X travels to New Zealand to investigate the sudden disappearance of the moa bird and those who say it still haunts the dense forests and plains of one of the world's most unexplored regions. Hidden in the depths of New Zealand's Te Papa Museum, ornithologist Alan Tennyson has access to one of science's greatest collections. Here lies the precious preserved remnants of the great moa, stored carefully away from the modern world. Uh, the moa were an amazing um, bunch of birds with 11 different species which evolved only in New Zealand. They include the largest bird in the world. The moas don't have any wing bones, they would have had no wings visible at all. Just a very large, bulky animal, probably just a dull brown all over, um, but covered from head to foot in um, feathers. This bone itself is about a metre long, and when you put that together with the other leg bones, you end up with a huge leg. They had no um, predators to kill them apart from the, the eagle which evolved alongside them, which was the largest eagle in the world. But at the turn of the 14th century, something happened that was to affect the moa forever, the arrival of man. Around the 1300s, the first people arrived to colonize these remote islands. Hunters and warriors by nature, they did not take long to settle in. Extinction biologist Dr. Richard Holdaway specializes in studying the moa's dramatic disappearance. What happened to the moa was that they were functioning perfectly normally in a fully functioning ecosystem, and within a century or so of human arrival, they went extinct. Something like 30% of New Zealand's birds became extinct um, in a few hundred years after human colonization. They more or less define the earliest uh, period of human occupation in New Zealand. It is known colloquially as the Moa Hunter period. Scientists may be convinced that the last of the Moas disappeared over 300 years ago, but deep inside New Zealand's interior, something has happened that questions their staunch beliefs. 
In 1993, ex-SAS officer Patty Freeney and school teacher Sam Waby came across something they had never seen before while walking through a forest. It was just a day out, lovely day, just to have a bit of a jaunt, but I always take the rifle with me, because you never know, you know, in these areas, anything can pop up. I was actually walking in the water on this, this rocky section, and I came to this obstacle and stopped and had to look over, and suddenly I saw this head of this, obviously a bloody big bird. We could see its head and neck, but not all of its body, and we were dumbfounded. And it came out in the open, it was the first time we saw it, complete, you know, covered in feathers, you know, stumpy legs, big bloody long neck and a head, beak, all the rest of it, claws. Just couldn't believe what we had seen, but decided that the only thing it could have been was a mower. And of course I had a camera on me, but I'm desperately trying to get it up, and get the old camera up, and I was sort of going click. Patty's photograph and the sighting caused a sensation in the country, which had long thought the bird was extinct. The photograph was eagerly published by the media, keen to establish the fact that one of their most exotic animals could still be alive. The scientists, however, were not convinced. If you ask my opinion of the image, it looks like the um, rear end of a deer looking over its shoulder. From the fossil bones like these, there haven't been any remains identified that are younger than about 600 years old, and there is, there's no real evidence that anything has survived past that time. Whether believers or skeptics, New Zealanders have been enthralled by the MOA for decades, and there is a history of elaborate hoaxes. One of the most famous of these was in 1954, when Mick Neville admitted to faking MOA prints along a riverbed. His son, Graham, still has the famous MOA shoes worn by his father. He used these uh, shoes, turned up three prongs and, uh, and three inch nails bent over and flattened out and, uh, and nailed them on a pair of shoes. He was a builder and um, undertaker and, and, and a practical joker. This unique bird has forged a strong place in New Zealand culture, but does this justify bringing the moa back from the dead? At Dunedin University, molecular biologist Scott Tebbett is working on a series of experiments which aim to study the DNA of the moa. If you find out about the genetics of the moa and compare it to a living relative, if you like, maybe an ostrich or an emu, then you could actually maybe tweak the DNA sequences of these other birds to actually turn them around, and actually get them to behave or look more like the mower. It requires future technologies that aren't actually here, so who knows, this is an, uh, an unknown quantity. Uh, it could be 50 years, could be 100 years. It's a pipe print, it's a wonderful one. I would be, as I say, only too happy to study a live mower. But I really think there's no chance whatsoever of there being another live mower either naturally or recreated. Alive or dead, the moa bird is a permanent part of New Zealand's history, culture, and folklore. And in a land which still has some of the world's most isolated regions, who's to say what may be living out there? A flightless bird from the past or a flight of fancy? After the break, Animal X looks at two other feathered creatures, one with powers to ruin a nation, the other to send a ship to the bottom of the ocean. Traditionally, sailors have taken the superstition about the albatross and they're very seriously indeed. And they say that as the body of the sail kind of rolls along underneath the waves, so the bird's soul tracks above the waves. Welcome back to Animal X. Animals have long been attributed with having magical powers and psychic abilities. Birds in particular have always held a special place in those beliefs. Time now to check out some famous animals of superstition. Since Neanderthal man, almost every culture has credited animals with supernatural powers that far outweigh our own. Are these powers real or are they just animal superstitions? So essentially, superstition is about 
an irrational belief in a particular power that's attributed to an animal. There's just hundreds of them. You can't stop. Almost every animal you name has a superstition attached to it. Animal X travels to London and Liverpool to look at two living manifestations of animal superstitions. The Tower of London sits high over the city as it has done for nearly a thousand years. It's believed that if the black ravens that reside in the tower ground should ever flee, the country will be destroyed. Ravens have been here ever since the place was first built in 1078. And by the late 1660s, there were hundreds and hundreds of them here. And the Astronomer Royal of that time asked the king that could we get rid of them because they were making a mess of all of his instruments. The king initially said yes, but then he was re-reminded of an old legend. They all leave, the great white tower will crumble and fall down, and along with it will fall the country and the monarchy. Now that frightened the king, so he said, right, by my royal decree, we'll always keep six ravens here. And from that day, we've always kept six. Since then, the country has always taken the raven superstition very seriously. Legend has it that during the Second World War, raven numbers dwindled to nothing. With Hitler at his height, Winston Churchill himself demanded that new birds be found and brought back to the tower to ensure the safety of the world. But is this a human need to believe, brought on by fear, or is there some truth lying behind these animal superstitions? Philippa Madden is a medieval historian at the University of Western Australia, and Dr. Alan Schaefer is a clinical psychologist and socio-analyst. Even though Churchill may have been a very rational person in many of the decisions and thoughts that he had to deal with, or ravens with their own peculiar characteristics, attract a certain belief system. That belief system gets expressed in very powerful ways, particularly under the highly emotive conditions of war. Well, ravens are a very good bird for the Tower of London because there are a number of superstitions connected with them. There's the one that says that they were originally the birds of Odin, the Viking birds. But also, in some parts of England, ravens were thought to be reincarnations of King Arthur. If you killed a raven, that was just terrible because King Arthur was alive in that bird. Can animals wield power over us? Medieval Europe was steeped in this kind of superstition, but do we still take it seriously? Well, I take it very seriously indeed. If a raven at the tower dies, Her Majesty has got to be told straight away. Two people who believe animal superstitions more than most are John Halligan and Albert Jenkins. 30 years ago, both these men were working on the ship Calpian Star. It was an ordinary ship, until one fateful day in 1959. An albatross that was being transported on board died. The crew decided to go on strike. I think they just walked off because I think they were doing sympathy with the dead, the dead albatross. <laughs> they just wouldn't go back on board the ship for somebody to say it would be unlucky. Traditionally, sailors have taken the superstition about an albatross and they're very seriously indeed. And they say that as the body of the sailor, he's been buried at sea obviously, the sailor's body kind of rolls along underneath the waves. So the bird's soul tracks above the waves. It's unlucky both to kill albatrosses and to see them around the boat. Why is it appearing? Why is it hovering around the boat? And the chances are it's coming to bring some kind of message of disaster. Determined not to sail on what they now saw as a doomed ship, the crew were replaced by a less superstitious group. However, the nightmare was only just beginning for the Calpian star. On June the 1st, 1960, 10 months after the albatross died, the ship sank. We were only out a few hundred yards when this explosion occurred, when the fire started. Most of the, um, the people on board the ship felt it was down to the albatross dying. There was no problems with the ship before it cut this damn bird. The Calpian Star had been plagued by misfortunes for most of the year before it sank. The ship had broken down several times and one of the crew members had died. Could that single albatross have been the harbinger of doom? I believe that everybody's superstitious to a certain extent. Some, sometimes you can actually see evidence of it. I still think in this case we did. <laughs> I mean, how many people had a ship sink on them? 
So perhaps animal superstitions could be the realization of animal powers after all. Harbingers of doom may be the stuff of nightmares, but what about real life creatures that can chill us to the bone? After the break, Animal X goes underground to check out what could be lurking deep below in our city's drainage system. Never know what might be down in the sewer system. The science says it's not there, but the myths might be real. Welcome back. It came out of the dark, damp sewers. It's beaked like jaws, chomping at anyone who came near it. Not a scene from a 50s horror movie, instead an eyewitness account of a real animal, one of the world's mysterious, yet elusive, drain dwellers. Urban legends have long told of colonies of bizarre creatures living and lurking deep within the bowels of a city sewer system. Surviving in a dark, shadowy world below us, rats, turtles, even alligators are rumored to roam the underground maze. There's a monster of the deep sitting there with its big, big head and didn't know what it was. The strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. Never know what might be down in the sewer system. The science says it's not there, but the myths might be real. To investigate claims of sewer survivors, Animal X travels to Sydney, Australia, where construction workers say they've discovered a bizarre creature, a beast who may have secretly survived in drains and sewers for decades. Tony Hughes was with a group of workmen on a construction site in inner Sydney when they discovered this endangered Native American snapping alligator turtle. I couldn't believe my eyes, just sitting there, it wasn't moving, had its mouth wide open, wasn't really interested, it looked like it was dead. We touched it, it just swung around, had a go at us, and got up on its front legs. Wildlife authorities believe it may be one of a batch of baby turtles stolen from the Australian Reptile Park north of Sydney in 1979. Reptile handler Craig Adams says this creature has an amazing ability to adapt to different environments. I guess this animal's been living in the drains, the canals, around the Sydney region for the last 20 odd years, chomping away on fish. Adams believes the turtle's long lost family, a whole colony of feral reptiles, could still be lurking in Sydney's drains and waterways. Something so cryptic as a, as a snapping turtle just beneath the murky, murky pond there, you just don't know they're there. You see them when they breathe, they just stick those little nostrils up, so they're um, masters of disguise. In New York, reptile rescuer Robert Shapiro has dedicated decades of his life to saving the city's abandoned animals. It's a very tame animal. Probably smell? never been able to, uh, never been grabbed behind the neck. That's, the, that's what happened. No. Shapiro, who operates an animal sanctuary from the back of his clothing store, claims it would be impossible for city sewers to be home to any mysterious creatures for long. They need sunlight. Ever been to a sewer? <laughs> There's not a lot of sunlight in the sewer. They need to eat food. They don't eat refuse. They eat actual animals. And they need to bask in the heat all the time, not stay in water. I mean, they, they, everything about a sewer is death for a reptile. This character was found abandoned in a bathtub when new owners moved into their inner city apartment. The genuine article. This is an American alligator. It's a little underfed, but it's, uh, it's a nice little baby. Shapiro says abandoned pets can end up in sewers and drains. They suffer a torturous death after being flushed down the toilet. The statistic is over 90% of reptiles bought die the first year of their lives. You're talking about millions of animals every year. Millions, multi-millions of animals. So that's a big problem. In 1983, in France, a live baby crocodile was pulled out of a Parisian sewer. No one is sure how it got there or how long it managed to survive before being discovered. Robert Adamski is a former deputy commissioner for the Department of Environmental Protection in New York. He knows well the legend of the city's sewer gators. 
children did in the 1930s. They were shoveling snow, put in a manhole, and uh, found an alligator. Um, after that, there was a famous sewer and uh, maintenance man named Teddy May, who uh, allegedly went in and cleaned out some more alligators in the sewer. That's how the myth started. But Adamski says, in the 6,500 miles of sewer systems around New York, inspectors have never found a live alligator. Most of the animals and most of the things that are found are dead. The travel time in the sewer is somewhat extensive. The conditions are not real conducive for most uh, living matter to survive. Perhaps in time, this dark, damp underworld will reveal more of its secrets. But until then, the question remains. Could strange drain dwellers be hiding in this harsh, hostile environment? From the moa bird, a giant back from extinction, or a hoax, to superstitions that are so powerful, grown men refuse to go to sea, and a creature that can endure 20 years living in a city's drains. The mysterious tales of the animal world continue to fascinate and perplex us. After all, it said there are stranger things in heaven and earth that we can think of. You've just seen some of them on Animal X.